Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I am not retired. I'm, I'm still in, in clinical practice, actually, for a short while. And um, I'm going to give my personal view first of uh, the, uh, uh, the Swedish need register, and then I will, I will actually uh, have to recall a bit of what uh, uh, Henrik Malko you know, just uh, uh, said in his uh, lecture. It started uh, in 1974 in uh, Uppsala. Uh, and the reason was, and I will give you the story, the Gepard prosthesis at that time had a left and right knee. Uh, and at that time, there was a famous orthopedic surgeon inserting uh, a right knee on the left side. And um, that uh, was taken up with him. And he was quite an intellectual. And he said, well, we have to see you know, what's going on in Sweden. If this is happening here, I would like, you know, a uh, uh, knee prosthetic surgery to be, uh, uh, you know, um, followed in Sweden. So my, my mentor uh, and myself, we were at that time in, in Uppsala in the anatomic theater, and um, there were 20 orthopedic surgeons present. Uh, we asked whether they were interested in volunteering, uh, starting up a Swedish knee register, and, and they said, oh, yes, at that time. That's, that's how it started, uh, with medical research money. And there was uh, uh, some leading figures that I would like to mention. And also, uh, I would like to recall that uh, in 75, there was actually uh, patient-related information at that time uh, collected, and also x-rays collected in 75. But it uh, was too heavy and cumbersome for us to continue with. The first one uh, on the joint uh, replacement side who uh, uh, started using the tumor survival analysis was actually Kai Knudsen in Lund, and he was in charge of the knee register for a period. Stefan Levold moved the knee register from uh, a very large computer into a small, small computer and created a program for uh, following uh, joint implant, and he was working with it intensively over a number of years. And he also made significant studies on different type of implants and, and survival studies on them. Uh, the real step forward came with the modern statistic analysis and, and uh, when Otto Robertson joined the register about 15 years ago, and he is still with us and he will speak actually tomorrow. Uh, this is the case uh, at the moment in, in Sweden. If you look into the number of uh, osteoarthritic cases that are increasing and they are now for primary osteoarthrosis surpassing uh, total, total hips in Sweden. A trend that we have seen in many other countries uh, and uh, it's much higher in the States, Australia, Canada for instance. I would like to, to uh, stress the following, uh, that uh, the Swedish knee register uh, is a prospective study. It's not randomized but it's, it's prospective study, which is looking at an intervention. And the important thing is that the real advantage of a randomized study compared to a regular study is that it is a, a reduction of confounding factors. And this is important. And I would, I would mention something to you uh, in, a, in a recent study that uh, some of the Swedish orthopedic surgeons have heard before, it is a JBDS study that was published in 2009 on the quality of traveling surgeons. Um, they reviewed Kinemax implant at the special center in UK, and uh, they published significant uh, bad results uh, in that study over a short period. Um, this is what they report as revisions. If we look into the same Kinemax implants in Sweden, uh, we find actually uh, a higher revision rate as well. And we also find an increase in revision rate of the Kinemax implant in Sweden uh, in later years. Um, what is very interesting is at the same time in the UK, there was a study in a hospital very close by who showed a premature failure of the Kinemax implant uh, at the same time actually, not related to the same instance where visiting Swedish orthopedic has, has been operating. The most striking finding at that hospital is that they uh, find fusion defects in the material. We looked into the Kinemax in Sweden and we found severe polymer wear in, in 42 out of 236, fracture, which is very uncommon today, in 12 out of 236, 
severe synovitis in 36 of 236, and severe or moderate bone resorption, I would say, in a high number. This is the way it looks. And the very interesting thing is that at the same time, Stryker recalled uh, the Stryker Kinemax implant in, in UK. So, what happened actually? If we look at those orthopedic surgeons, those 10 who have been operating in the UK, this is what they have been done in Sweden uh, during uh, the same period. And uh, this is the curve. In, um, if you look at this, is, this is the, the curve in, in, in UK and the curve in Sweden. The interesting thing with the UK study is that it's influenced by bias because they recall the patients uh, at, at an outpatient uh, department, and at that time uh, they were then uh, later revised. It turned out that the surgeons operating in Sweden, compared to when they were operating in UK, had, had a different outcome. So this is the figures here, and it's really a matter of significant bias uh, in, in that study. I would like to uh, uh, mention why it is uh, difficult to uh, uh, perform a randomized study. It is almost impossible uh, to do concerning joint implants. Um, and what is there around uh, concerning knee arthroplasties? If you search Medline and you don't look at technique, but you, you compare really different implants, um, there are uh, there is nothing around. If you don't look into technique or use stereophotogrammetry, there is none. There is really none. So this is why national registers are important. And it's also important that uh, if we uh, look into what's being published at the moment, uh, results from individual centers may not be expressing the result of the average surgeon. We recently performed a study um, which uh, looked into indications. And this is also important when you look into individual centers. This is uh, now in press where we, find, uh, where we find out that there are differences in indications. So we don't operate even the same patients at the different units in Sweden. So there are significant differences in indications between different hospitals in Sweden. Now some history here. This is uh, uh, what it looks like concerning unicompartmental implants in uh, 1989 to 98, and total knees. This is the spread in Sweden, the best and the worst, total knees and unicompartmental knees. Uh, this is just to uh, ease you down a bit. There is an improvement if we look into uh, uh, different time differences, and you will probably hear the same from Peter Herberts. But what is most important if you look on, on the, the curve here on your left side, you will realize that, that we are narrowing the gap between individual units in Sweden. But still, of course, if you look into the spread, there will still be one who is good and one who is bad. There will still be a spread. But we are shrinking the gap you know, in between them, which is really what the knee registers are. You know, that, that, that the worst one, they are, they are coming closer to the good ones. We have been able to outdate the implants over the time. This is the PCR unit that was outdated. We have been able to compare our data uh, with the similar databases, for instance, in, in Australia, where we could look at a larger amount of implants and see whether it could be verified. Recently, with Australia, and this cooperation are continuing. We have, through uh, work uh, from, uh, initiated by, by Gothenburg here, uh, Jörn Gaelic started up a cooperation in, in Scandinavia where we have looked into uh, the recession rate in the Scandinavian country, but also uh, the incidence of, of uh, surgery for, for uh, osteoarthritis. And you can see there is a rise in all Scandinavian countries. And what is very interesting is that the results in Sweden uh, is significantly better for total knees compared to Denmark and Norway, probably based on that they started with their register about 10, 15 years later than we did in Sweden. We have been able to show that surgical routine makes a difference and publish that, uh, if you do more or less. 
we have been able to show that if you, you have an, a successful implant and you start doing mini-invasive surgery without having good instruments for that, that the results get worse. Uh, and we looked into three common uni implants when the mini-invasive surgery came. It was quite clear that without training, proper training, without good instrument, the result goes down. So studies with good results are more often published. Well, this is, this is a fact. If you look into, the, for instance, the US and, and Sweden, and uh, you go to the official figures, you will find that, that the published studies from the, from the states uh, in the journals are actually quite good. But if you go to the official statistics, looking at the revision burden, you will find that we have a lower revision burden. It's, it's not a very good measure of, of uh, survival, but we have a lower revision burden in, in Sweden compared to the United States, for instance, for total needs, and it's going down. So, uh, in summary of those findings, before I I'll continue a little bit further, is that centers publishing results might not be representative of the average surgeons in the average setting, and volume affects results. Um, I'm, I'm going over to a subject which is, is very close to my heart because I, I made my PhD work on orthopedic infections in 1973. And this is that we eventually are seeing again an increasing risk of uh, revision at least for deep infections. And in this year's report for 2009, we're actually seeing the same thing for total lease as well. This is in, in the report that we are putting together now. So it might be that, that we, we, are, we are eventually seeing a problem here. And this is, uh, for the total needs today, the most significant problem in total needs is infection. It is the remaining problem. And we started to look into uh, whether patients got prophylactic antibiotics in time. And again, it was interesting to me because we published, and I published in 1973 again in the, the American Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, the first randomized study on prophylactic antibiotics. And we, when we started to look at that in our own unit and in Sweden, it turned out that we had actually very bad, you know, uh, very bad results in, in giving it in, in appropriate time. And it is known in this. Uh, a study here that, that I referred to by, by in 2008 that prophylactic antibiotics is, has, has a significant effect on reducing the, the infection. If you look at this, uh, the one on the left is uh, uh, actually from our own department in Lund. They should receive the antibiotic in a total knee about 15 to 45 minutes before the surgery. And between the red lines you can see those patients who did it it's about 50%. Some of them get, you know, uh, it's several hours after the surgery. Some, some get several hours before the surgery. And only 50% get their adequate antibiotics in the time they should. We know that we should do it, but it does not work very well. We made a sample in Sweden, and we could show the same thing for orthopedic surgeons in Sweden. They had as, as bad results as we had. So we are not following, you know, the principles that we know where we should give our antibiotics. We have now in our knee register entered a, a variable uh, where we see when it's given. And it has gone up to about 70, 72 percent. We are still, you know, this year about 30 percent who is not given the antibiotics in an appropriate time, which is, of course, not good. Another thing we can see in, in the PhD work that is going to come up here in the autumn is that the number of resistant germs, uh, especially on the Staphylococcus epidermis, is increasing significantly, and also the amount. So now they are dominating in Sweden, and this is again something that is, is, is important to look into and to know. And at the moment we are also carrying out a study on isolating uh, bacteria from those patients who are being operated in, in uh, Sweden. Uh, Henrik Malka, in his presentation about 15 minutes ago, he was alluding, you know, to orthopedic surgeons, you know, why they, why they move. You had Australia, you had UK, you had US, and you had Sweden. And they were all, you know, performing, they were all changing. Why are orthopedic surgeons changing? 
I think they are changing based on the same principle as Mae West had. She said, between two evils, I always pick the one I never tried before. I think that's one reason, you know, you like to change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars. Uh, do we have any questions for Lars, specifically on the knee register? Okay. So, thank you. I think it's good with the perspective that you.